Parallel Online, so glad you're here joining us today for part two of the Rethink series. This series has shifted our perspective of what church is all about. And if you're watching, you're not going to want to tune in or like you're not going to want to tune out early. <laughs> oh my gosh. Let's take that back. You're not going to want to tune out early or shut it off early. Watch this all the way through and follow along with us for the rest of the series because I think you're going to get something out of it. I just know you will. <laughs> so good. I'm Jen and this is Tim and we're your online campus pastors here at Parallel Church. We're so excited that you're joining us today. If you're joining us for the first time, we would love to connect with you. We have live hosting members standing by in the chat. Give us a little wave. Let us know where you're from. Maybe you're very favorite emoji tell us about how favorite your day is going <laughs> what is your favorite emoji uh, oh, probably like the head exploding one or like the like <laughs> like the mind blown one or like i use the uh, i use the clap hands a lot yeah yeah that's probably my even favorite. on simple statements because i think you've texted me once you're like hey pick up milk clap, clap, clap. <laughs> you did it <laughs> <laughs> you remembered. <laughs> well, I'm this in the grocery store series. and my mind is blown. <laughs> uh, so funny. <laughs> It's true, though. <laughs> there are so many good things happening through the series. I love the question that Pastor Kelly started out our first mm -hmm. uh, installment of the series with. He said, is there something that you've been believing your entire life that you now know to be false? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So I'm throwing that at you. Oh, you're throwing it at me. You don't want to like confess that you confess to the first service? <laughs> no, not necessary. Uh, I don't really have one though, I don't think. I was like trying to think of something last week and I couldn't really think of anything. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. For those yeah. who didn't watch the first service, I confess to believing the Backstreet Boys were cool and yeah. realizing they're not. I have no comment. <laughs> no, I mean there was a stage, so BSB uh -huh. if you're out there watching, I was a fan at one point. It's out there now. It's out there now. The I can't <laughs> take it back. Oh, vulnerability. It's too bad. It hurts. Oh, well. Hurts. <laughs> well, guys, we would love for you to share this online experience. We know you have friends and family that need to hear this message of hope today. It's a good one. It's a great one to take lots of notes and yes. ask lots of questions. So participate. Throw your comments in the chat. We would love to hear uh, how this is hitting home and different how it's yeah. How would things are landing with you? So give us uh, give us all your input. Comment lots. Yeah, you know what I'm finding is that throughout the this brain series, exploding the emoji, brain <laughs> explosion. Um, yeah. I'm finding a lot of new people coming back to church. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of kids coming back to church. Lots it's of true. people coming back to church after being isolated for quite some time. This is that season. So if you're feeling like that, I want you to know we have an online campus that runs throughout the week. Go to Facebook. Type in Parallel Online Campus. Mm -hmm. It is a whole community that is spread across the entire world where people come together, meet throughout the week. Tuesday night is per night at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Wednesday night's Connect Night, House Party Night at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Mm -hmm. Thursday night right now, our group is going through, some of our group is going through a rooted course, and that's just getting deeper into our belief mm -hmm. system and understanding what the scriptures really say. And a lot of that course is actually breaking down mis- conceptions about yep, what we believe at a young age and now realizing something different it's true so you are not without community if you're watching from a distance make sure you become part of that online campus for us here at the lethbridge campus today we are about to go into a time of worship and we believe that worship is the best way to break discouragement so i don't know what your week was like but i want you to stand up sing with us turn the volume up pull over to the side of the road <laughs> blare it through the sound system uh, turn off your car engine, of course, and do it safely. But as we go into worship with the team, won't you join us?
Good morning, Parallel Church. You guys are looking great today. Man, do we have a good day for you guys. Rethink is our new series. We're in part two. Last week, Pastor Kelly preached. It was so, so good. He's going to be coming up in a little while. We've got a few things to give you guys some details. We're Ralph and Cindy. We're the location pastors here. We're just trying to make you at ease as to what's going on today. So if you're brand new, Cindy's got some information for you guys. Yes, well, if you're new, welcome. We're so excited to have you here. If you did not get a gift on your way in, please stop at the new here table on your way out. I will be there. I have a gift for you just saying, hey, thanks for coming and visiting us and come back. If you have little ones, babies to grade five, right through these doors here to my right. The kids love it. It's so much fun. They have such a blast. You get to come in here, put your feet up and hear Pastor Kelly's amazing message. All right, this first song, I'm going to get you guys to stand because we're going to do our music part right now. This first song is so killer. We're going to ask you if you can move in because this is going to fill up today. That'd be great. But we'd love it if you guys would participate by clapping. This first, again, you're going to love it. We're going to put the words on the screen too to make it easy. All right, let's do it, guys. Oh, I see signs and I see one. 
turn this thing around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything. church. It's one of my favorite songs because it just brings to light the reality of what we're in the midst of what we're standing in. He is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something right now. There was a time when I was uh, earlier on in my faith, like I wasn't going to church regularly. I was kind of, what is, what is the term? Backslidden, something like that. Um, <laughs> but there was a time where I'd show up in services like this and you know, there'd be songs about God's ability to heal, God's ability to save, God's ability to turn his life, your life around. And I would sit there and be like, well, why not me? Why not now? 
why have I waited so long? It's like, if God knows every ounce and detail of my life, then why isn't it changing? Why isn't it turning? And in my mind, I was thinking, it says either he didn't want to do it for me or is that I didn't deserve for it to happen. And if this is a similar mindset that one of you is carrying while you're standing here today is that I want to, can we, can we just break it apart a little bit? Because I think it's, I think that's a wrong mindset to have. Because it says in Acts 17, verse 24, it says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. I like that part, everything else. So it's not just enough that we're living, but he actually supplies everything else. And so it doesn't matter whether I should come up short in my efforts to prove my, my, my holiness to him or whatever it may be. It's like I could spend all of my efforts all day long and get completely exhausted trying to please God. And he's just up there like, I accept you already for who you are. It's like you're already there. You don't need to work for this grace. You don't have to do something to get a gold star on the miracle chart for me to move in your life. You know what I'm saying? That's how good our God is. And so if you're standing here today, you're like, you don't know my week. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've said. Can I just remind you right now that God sees past all of that, completely transparent to the point where he sees your heart and knows your intention. And all he's asking, I know that when my kids mess up, all I'm asking is for them to be like, I'm here. Like, I just need love. Like, and he's the same thing looking at you today. And what seems unreasonable for you to expect is normal for God to produce. We look through all scripture, resurrection life. It seemed unreasonable, but he did it. Healings on the spot, he did it. It seemed unreasonable for those that were on their last limbs of faith, but God did it today. While we pray, pray for adopt my adopted grandson in car, motorbike accident, cuts and bruises and a broken bone and leg, but well enough to leave the hospital last night. Come on. This is good news. And I know some of our friends from Fresh Start are here. Come on. Come on. We celebrate these, these people for their accomplishments, what they're going through. God, we just thank you that you are the miracle worker in this place today, Father, that there is no shortage in your blessing. God, we pray for your grace over our lives. We thank you, God, that for every circumstance that is needing a turnaround, that God, you be the miracle worker in that today. You are faithful, God, in everything that you do, Father. Your word is true. Your character is true. You're sturdy enough to rely on. So, Father, this morning, remind us of your goodness. Remind us of the price that your son paid on the cross for God so that we could be set free. We thank you, God, so much for what you're doing in our lives. God, give us the God, give us the wisdom to know what to do and the courage to do. We just thank you, Father, that you are more than enough in our circumstance. And as we sing this, Father, let our thanks go up to you. We thank you, God, in advance for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Have any of you ever thought or had a moment where you just wished God would speak to you? Maybe you heard somebody else say, God told me, or I really sense God said, and you're like, man, I wish God would speak to me that way. Anybody feel that way? Or maybe you got in a situation where you're like, man, I'd really like God's presence. I'd really sense, I need God's presence. I wish I could sense God's presence. I see other people getting moved. I see other people connecting with God. I just want, anybody want to admit that, you know what the psalmist said? The psalmist said it this way. He says, I can enter with thanksgiving. I can enter his courts with praise. In other words, David was saying, the password to God's presence is thank you. It's gratitude. It's just simply thank you. So I'm going to invite the team to sing this again. And if you're ever wanting to sense God's presence, maybe you've never lifted your hands before, this is the time to do it. To say, I mean, how desperate are we for God to move to say, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Let's sing it one more time. Come on. God, that you're still on the throne, that you're still in control. Thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you that you bore all sickness and infirmities on the cross and that by your stripes we were healed. Thank you that you supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory. Thank you that you give us a peace that passes all understanding and a joy that can be our strength. Thank you that you're the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper. We thank you, Lord, that, that you specialize in making a way where there is no way. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your presence here in this place, that where two or three are gathered there, you are right in the middle of it. And Lord, I thank you that each one that needs a touch from you, that right now they're sensing your Holy Spirit. You never leave us, never forsake us. We thank you that we're invited to cast all of our cares on you because you care for us. Thank you. Thank you. Amen, amen. Isn't God good? Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Parallel Church. One church in five physical locations. So let's welcome everyone that's joining us this morning from Tabor, Claire's home, Okotoks, Lloydminster. Welcome Lethbridge. 
Welcome all of you joining us online, wherever you guys are watching from around the world. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to part two of our series we've entitled Rethink. And yes, the subtitle is Deconstructing Modern Christianity. And if you weren't here last Sunday and you didn't hear last Sunday's message, I'd highly encourage you to go back. Uh, you can find it on YouTube or on our website and, and go back and listen to that message because that message really does set a foundation for what we're talking about in this series. But why are we, why are we doing this series? And in particular, why are we talking about deconstructing modern Christianity? Because, I mean, that's, that's a kind of a, it's a trendy term right now, deconstructing faith. There's a lot we see in the news, you know, big name celebrities deconstructing their faith. And it's become, we have friends, maybe you know somebody who says, I'm deconstructing or I deconstructed my faith. So why are we, why are we talking about and, and I think because we hear that, I think in church world especially, we, we get a bad connotation when we hear the word deconstructing, like someone's deconstructing their faith, oh no, it's, it's falling apart, and it's always negative. But can I just say that there's some times, there's some times when we need to deconstruct. Anybody else have a time where you thought one way, maybe about finances, and then you deconstruct your current thought and your mindset, and you learn something new, and because you learned something new, you had a breakthrough? Or anybody maybe in your health, you thought one way and then all of a sudden you deconstructed a certain activity or a certain way that you're doing things and began to rethink some things and, and had a breakthrough. Or maybe in relationships or marriages, you had this idea or this, this ingrained thinking when you're growing up that this is how a husband's supposed to be, this is how a wife's supposed to be. And then you deconstructed some of those preconceived ideas and learned how to do it better. Anybody else? I'm putting all my limbs up for all those things. So sometimes deconstruction is important. And we're talking about deconstructing modern Christianity. And, and the reason why we're doing this series, if we want to know why, is because over the last five months of my sabbatical and all the rest, I grew increasingly dissatisfied with the, the fruit of the modern-day Big C Church. When I say Big C Church, I mean the global representation of, of Christianity on the planet. And I, I grew increasingly dissatisfied with the, re, the fruit, the results, and, and especially in comparison to the results that I see in the book of Acts. When I see the fruit, the results, that, that 11 men starting in Jerusalem in an upper room had over a short period of time uh, on, on the then known world, without technology, without all of the resources we have today, I look at that and I go, man, if they could do it, how come we're not seeing the same thing? And maybe the reason why we're not seeing the same fruit as they did is because maybe we're thinking differently than they did, or maybe our understanding of our faith today is different than an understanding of how we do church and how we are Christians, what a Christian is. Maybe it's different. Especially if you're to poll the world today, come on, if you're to poll the world, you, you, you don't have to poll the world, you can just poll your friends, yeah. right? And your friends find out you're a Christian, is their response positive or negative? Most of the time, it's like, you're a what? Did you know, we read it last week, that if you were to state you were a Christian in the first century, it says they had favor with all the people. That it was embraced. That it was, they were celebrated. And I'm going, that's different. Isn't that different enough? Maybe we have to rethink some things. Last week we started rethinking, in particular about this verse. And, and one word in this verse, in Matthew 16. It's, a, it's quoting, Matthew's quoting Jesus. Jesus is talking, having discussion with his disciples. He just asked them, hey, who do you guys think I am? Peter speaks up and says, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're, you're the son of God. And then Jesus' response to Peter is, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Did you know, and if you are here last week, you know this already. If you weren't, go back and watch. Pay attention to this. But the word church is not the word that Jesus used. Jesus did not say, I will build my church. That word is mistranslated. 
And it wasn't mistranslated by accident. We learned this last week. It was translated church on purpose. In fact, people were killed for trying to translate it the proper way, in the right word. That word, just that word. People were martyred because they tried to translate it accurately. Jesus didn't say, I will build my church. In fact, it probably shocked his disciples that Jesus, a rabbi, the son of God, the Messiah, a religious leader, didn't say, I will build my synagogue. He didn't say, I will build my temple. I will build my tabernacle. He didn't say, I will build my, my you know, global empire of synagogues. Or ta-. He didn't say that at all. Jesus said, I will build. This is the word that he used. He says, I will build my ecclesia. Ecclesia is the exact word Jesus used. It was a Greek word. It was something that was very common. It wasn't a religious word. It, it, was a very, it was a secular word common to the Greeks. The Romans used it. The Roman Empire used this word. It, it simply translated mean, meant a social political gathering of citizens who were called together to attend to the concerns of their city. So watch. Jesus didn't say, I will build my synagogue, I will build my temple. He didn't say, I will build my church. Which, if you were to look at the Oxford Dictionary definition of, of church, it's a building that Christians gather and worship in. Jesus didn't say, synagogue, temple, church. In other words, he didn't say, I will build my static institution of which we gather at, at a location at a specific time led by a clergy. He didn't say, I will build that. He said, I will build my ecclesia, my social political gathering of citizens who are called together to attend to the concerns of the city. In, in the Greek and Roman culture, an ecclesia would be like, I will build my city council. Right, because that's what an ecclesia was. It was the city council, a group of citizens gathering together to meet, uh, to discuss the concerns and take care of the concerns of the city. He could have said, I will build my senate or I will build my legislature, gathering of citizens. And the disciples probably were curious and they kind of looked and like, what do you mean ecclesia? You're going to build, you're going to build an ecclesia, a senate, a city council? What, what, What do you mean? And then Jesus went on to describe, because the Romans had this, an ecclesia, a common term for them was convitus, which was a gathering of two or three Romans about the, could meet about the concerns of the empire and with the authority of the empire and of Caesar. And then Jesus, right after he says, I'll build my ecclesia, he says, and wherever two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst. So we learned this last week, and we deconstructed some of that thinking, and we're saying, okay, if the ecclesia, or if the church, Jesus didn't say, I'll build my static institution or organization. Jesus said, I will build a buildingless, mobile people movement designed to operate 24-7 in the marketplace for the purpose of impacting everybody and everything. That's what he said. And the early church believed him. And the early church did exactly that. And the results they got is proof in the pudding that Jesus chose the right strategy. But here we are, thousands of years later, and we are more familiar with church, the static institution. We're more familiar with, with the large gatherings. And we go to, and we, our, our public expression of worship is we go to a building just like this. Come on, we're here right now. And we go at a certain time, a certain place. We gather together just like this to listen to a preacher. And Jesus didn't want, that wasn't his design. His design was something different, two or threes. That two or three have the same power and authority of the king. Come come on. Two or three. Now, Paul, who grew up in the static institution, he was formerly Saul of Tarsus. Uh, uh, a widely known and high-ranking Pharisee who some scholars believe that, that Paul or, or Saul of Tarsus was being promoted to the place where he was going to one day become the high priest overseeing all of the Pharisees in the nation of Israel. Paul wrote this when he got converted. He wrote this in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, and he gave some, Jesus gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. 
this is quoted often, especially in charismatic churches. Uh, this is quoted often, this, this verse. Now watch. If we read this verse through the filter of understanding church, synagogue, temple, we can read it this way, that he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers, for the overseeing of the saints, for the work of the ministry within the institution, so that we can build bigger churches. That's how we'd read it. If you read this verse through the way that Jesus intended to be read, where I will build my ecclesia, a building list, people movement in the, in the marketplace, you'll read it differently. You're saying, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the equipping, that means skill develop, of the saints for the work of the ministry. Okay, so what does ministry mean? Well, the, the Greek word for ministry here is actually the word di, uh, diakonos, diakonos. It means a, it's servant or a minister. Its usage would be for like, you, this is what you, a diakonos would be a waiter, a waitress, uh, a servant, anyone who performs any service or administrator. So he says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, you're going to equip people to wait on others, to serve others. I'm going to create a, a, a ministry of service and equip you for that. So here becomes the, the next question is where is that service? Where is that ministry? Because if we, if we understand, you know, church, Static institution, it would, we would assume that all of that ministry happens in the church. And come on, I've, I've grown up thinking that, that ministry, I'm called to ministry. I felt called to ministry. So guess what? I did all of my ministry, all of my service in the church. I, I'm called to ministry. We think it's work within the church. But that's not what Paul necessarily meant, that the work of service And from the early church, and I'll show you this. I'll show you from Paul's ministry how Paul had to learn this himself. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 is is after Paul's uh, great conversion in Acts chapter 9 where he was a ranking Pharisee on the way to to actually persecute Christians and to kind of put out that whole movement. Jesus interrupted him on that journey, and he got radically an encounter with God, a radical encounter with God, and he ended up spending three years, is what we read, three years with Peter and John and the disciples learning and being taught how, how to be a Christian. And then in Acts 13, the Christians are gathered together, and they, they're praying, and in the midst of that prayer, it says that they felt, and they laid hands on Paul and Barnabas, and they sent Paul out. And his first missionary journey, in fact, my Bible says is Paul's first missionary journey is in Acts 13, and Paul gets sent out. Now, now watch this. In Acts 13, verse 48, it says, when, when the Gentiles heard this, and, and, and this is in uh, Poseidon, Antioch, by the way, this, it says, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Okay, now this is great success. Paul's having great success. In fact, when I read the book of Acts, I become, I've talked about this, I become very envious of of the results, and that they got results everywhere, and everywhere Paul went and preached. Great and tremendous results. It's amazing. Then you read the next verse, And I've always highlighted the results. The next verse, verse 50 says, but, that's a big word, the Jewish leaders incited God-fearing women of high standing because they wanted to get things done. (laughs) And the leading men of the city, and they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and and expelled them from the region. Okay, so Paul goes and preaches in Poseidon, Antioch, and has great results, and many are believing, and all of a sudden the Jews rise up, and they begin to, begin to persecute them because he's a threatening their static institution, and so they begin to, they begin to persecute him. And I'm, I'm like, well, that's not a big surprise. Jesus taught his disciples to expect persecution. It's going to come. You're going to suffer for my name's sake, he said. So persecution, I've always read that, and I was like, yeah, yeah, they, they got persecuted, yeah. And you feel for them and going, I mean, there's one time that Paul got beat up so bad and left for dead, stoned, left for dead, not recreationally, rocks. <laughs> he got stoned and left for dead outside the city. You know what Paul did? Paul got up and went back into the city. And I was like, man, that dude's built different than me. I'd be like, peace out. Like, I'm out of here. Right? I mean, I mean, 
Paul went back in the city, started preaching again. Oh, this guy's built different. But what caught my attention in this verse, not the persecution, what caught my attention is that he was, they were expelled from the region. Not just from the city, from the region. They got expelled. They got removed. Which I looked at and I was like, okay, they got persecuted, but they got expelled from the region. That's next level. And they, they were unable to do ministry there. They left a few believers and had to move on. And we see Acts you know, 14, 15, 16, Paul's doing the same, same results, same things happen. In fact, in Acts 17, he comes to Thessalonica, and the same thing happens. He preaches, a bunch of, of people get saved, there's great things that are happening, and then all of a sudden persecution rises up, and then verse 10 says, as, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Acts 17, what, what happens? In the middle of the night, the believers that are there have to create an escape in the middle of the night so that nobody sees them. Paul is again expelled from a city, expelled from a region. And this seems to be the trend. Wherever he goes, he preaches, people get saved, persecution rises up, and he gets kicked out of the reason, region. And then something shifts. And Paul changes his strategy. In fact, in fact, he was known as Saul of Tarsus. When he started his ministry, he, he started his ministry. You can see it in, the, in Acts 13. He started his ministry under the identity of Saul of Tarsus. And his habit was to first go into the synagogue. Well, of course, when Saul of Tarsus walks into any synagogue in, in the nation of Israel, any synagogue, he goes with a reputation. He was a high-ranking Pharisee from Jerusalem. And he walks in with that title, he walks in with authority, and he begins to speak in the synagogue. They're listening, and some of them get saved because this is Saul of Tarsus. They're listening, but also some begin, after he speaks for a while, some begin to rise up and going, wait a second, that's countering the law. That's countering what we're preaching. You're preaching against our institution. Hold up, and they begin to persecute him. They send him out, and then all of a sudden, he changes his name from Saul. That's a good Jewish name, from Saul. To Paul, that's a good Roman name. And he goes from being Saul of Tarsus, the Pharisee, to all of a sudden he goes to Paul. And watch what he does and what his strategy changes. In Acts 18, it says, After this, Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. And there uh, he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, and, and was recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius, who's the emperor of the time, had ordered all of the Jews to leave Rome. And Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Okay, now watch. Paul initially, Saul of Tarsus initially, would walk into a city, and he would, he would preach from the pulpit of the synagogue with the authority of a religious leader, with the persona of a religious leader. And here, all of a sudden, he changes in Corinth, he changes his persona, and he begins to work. Look at this. He begins to work as Paul, a Roman citizen, a tent maker in the community. So what happens? What happens is all of a sudden, a whole bunch of people get saved, and the same things happen. A bunch of people get saved. A great movement happens, and the Jews rise up in the exact same way to persecute him. And Paul's thinking, here we go again. Again. Now I'm getting booted out of here. But watch what happens in this trial. Acts 18, it says this, verse 12. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, Gallio was the Roman proconsul. Proconsul like Pilate was a proconsul, which means the Roman appointed authority over the region. Okay? He's the chief. He's the head of the region. When Gallio, Gallio was uh, proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charge, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. What Gallio should have done, what every other proconsul had done, what Pilate had done. See, Pilate didn't find Jesus guilty. Pilate appeased the Jewish crowd because Pilate's job as proconsul was to keep peace in the region. And if there's a whole bunch of worked up Jews that could create riots and problems, then I, he will do whatever. If it means killing one man, okay, we'll kill one man to appease that crowd and we have peace in the region. That's why Pilate you know, had Jesus killed. This Gallio should have, should have to appease the Jews like every other proconsul, should have said, you're right, 
Um, he's broken your, he's upset you guys. Okay, fine. You can have him do that. But Gallio doesn't do that. This is what he says, just as Paul was about to speak. Because Paul's about to speak because he's like, here I go again. I'm going to make a defense for myself. It's me and against all these guys. As Paul's about to speak, Gallio interrupts him and says this. If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since uh, it involves questions and words and names that in your law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. And so it sounds like he's just washing his hands, but wait a second. The fact that he's not willing to appease this riot is different. It's different. But what's even more different is what happens next. What happens next in verse 16, it says, so he drove them off. Gallio drove the the Jewish rioters off, the religious leaders off. Then the crowd, not the Christians, the crowd, what what was that? This was the city of Corinth comes out because there's a big disturbance. We want to go see. We want to watch what's happening. The crowd that there's watching this disturbance, this disturbance, there turns on Sothenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the pro council, and Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. I'm like, ho, oh, ho, hold up. Previously, Paul gets kicked out of a region. When Paul presented himself as Saul of Tarsus, the religious leader, kicked out of the region. Nobody there to defend him. And all of a sudden, in the very city that, that he goes as Paul... Uh, uh, you know, the Roman citizen, the tent maker, he changed his pulpit. And the position of his pulpit, and the moment he did that, it was the community themselves that defended him. Watch this. The next verse. Paul stayed in Corinth for some time. Yeah, he did. He got kicked out of the region everywhere else. And when Paul stays in a place for some time, come on, this is, Paul moved with a different level of authority. The church, I mean, three quarters of our New Testament, Paul's words, he had had authority over the church. When he stays in Corinth for for a period of time, we have 1 and 2 Corinthians, like he had an impact on this church for a reason. And the church was able to grow stronger there because Paul was able to stay. And the reason why Paul was able to stay is because all of a sudden Paul began to learn. He was getting soul saved everywhere. But he began to learn, lasting fruit happens if I change my approach, if I rethink, if I can deconstruct my upbringing of understanding that, it, that, that religious things happen from the synagogue. If I can change the pulpit and, and realize that religious things don't just happen from the, from the synagogue, that if I can understand that God still moves with the same power and the same authority, if not more so when I move my pulpit to the marketplace... And when I can preach from here, when I, ch- when I change and rethink from thinking church, that all of my spiritual walk and all of my, all of my time with God is, is spent in my religious part of my life is in church. If I can change that thinking and realize that I am, no, no, I'm part of the ecclesia, which is a gathering of citizens who take care of the concerns of their city. When I understand that I'm an ecclesia and I can be a tent maker and I can make a contribution so great to that city that that city will defend me. I'm going to stay there. And it got, it gets better. It gets better. In Acts 19, Paul goes into Ephesus, which we get the book of Ephesians. In which we get the book of First and Second Timothy, because Timothy was the end up being the head pastor of, of Ephesians. Look at what happens. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke briefly. So he he starts. He, he does what his habit is to do. He enters the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months. Three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. You don't say. I think Paul would learn this by now. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. The way is the title they gave to Christians at the time. So Paul left them and he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. You know what he said? He says, man, he, he changed pulpits again. He changed pulpits from the synagogue after three months of arguing persuasive the year. And he's like, forget that. I'm going to go to the, the, the marketplace 
public hall, and I'm going to use this as my pulpit. He went to the university. And he used it as his pulpit. And the result? Well, there's many people saved. And then guess what? The institution started a riot. And they began to persecute Paul. And the same thing happens again. But now what happens is the secular city clerk, you can read it, Acts 19. The secular city clerk of Ephesus comes to his defense. And Paul was able to stay a number of years because look at the next verse. And we read this verse last week. This went on for two years from this pulpit that all of the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Not some, not most, all, just all of Asia. <laughs> no Instagram, no YouTube, no airplanes, all. Okay. When Paul began to rethink his identity and his approach, he saw different results. He went from being the religious leader in the synagogue to a marketplace contributor involved in the welfare of the city. He went from church to ecclesia. And upon leaving, he stayed for the rest of his ministry in Ephesus. And then at the end of his, his ministry, he felt that the Holy Spirit was calling him to go to Jerusalem. And he told them, you're never going to see me again. This is what he's telling them. And he knew that his journey, to, he felt really strongly the Holy Spirit called him to Jerusalem. And he says, when I go there, I'm probably going to be arrested. I'm probably going to be killed. He had a reputation there. And, and they think he had a reputation everywhere at this point. And he says, I go there. I'm not coming back. He knew it. And so he makes the journey. But before he makes the journey, he, he gives a very impassionate speech to the leaders in Ephesus. And this is what he says. He tells them, he tells them, and you can read it yourself, tells them, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, this kind of hard work, the verses before, he basically goes on to explain that, hey, I didn't ask you for any money. I didn't ask you for any support. I, I supported myself. You saw me working as a tent maker. I supported myself, and I supported our disciples, the ones that I'd raised up. And also, apparently, he helped the weak. He says, I showed you by this kind of hard work of working all through the day in my business and making this as my pulpit and doing all this. And he preached at night and did different things as well. He says, he says but I also helped the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. What's he saying? He's saying, church, he's saying, hey, Christians, we're not the static institution. We're ecclesia. We're called to make an impact in the city so great that if you make an impact in the city, you saw it that the city clerk defended me because I was a contributor to the city. I made a difference. I had favor among the city. The Jews, yeah, the, the Jews, the religious static institution, they don't like that because they can't control me. They don't like that. They try to persecute me. But the city... Be the ecclesia. Help the weak. It's more blessed to give than to receive. If you do this, if you change this, the church will prosper. This is ecclesia. So now watch. Come on. Why, am I, why are we rethinking? Because listen, it's been ingrained in me my entire life my whole Christian walk that ministry is in the institution. That if you're called to ministry, it's in the institution. But what if we were to rethink? What if we were to rethink and going, if we're ecclesia, if, if wherever two or three are gathered, two or three doesn't constitute a church, does it? If two or three are gathered, that's not even a home group. Come on. It's just two or three. So what's the big deal? Wherever two or three are gathered, there Jesus is in the midst of them. If we get this idea and saying, well, there's only two of us Christians at work. Hmm. Yeah. You know what you got? You got an ecclesia. What, what, are, what if we, there's only two Christians. There's only another Christian with me at school. Mm -hmm. What if we were to rethink the ministry? And that, listen, what did Paul say hey, to the Ephesians? The Ephesians, what did Paul say? He said, 
The role of the pastor is not to do the ministry. The role of the pastor is to skill develop the saints to do the work of the ministry. My job, equip, is to skill develop you to use your pulpit. So starting next Sunday, I'm going to teach you how to not be a weird Christian. I'm going to teach you as Jesus taught. Jesus taught his disciples not to be weird synagogue Jewish type people. He taught them how to actually make an impact in the, in the community. And he taught them in order which to do this. And he taught them a way to do this. And I'm, I'm going to equip you for your pulpit. Because all of a sudden, if we, if we go from just this being the pulpit, this platform, this right here, if we go from this being the pulpit, this is the only place the gospel can be preached, to all of a sudden we've got ecclesias, we've got ecclesias everywhere, and pulpits everywhere, we can transform. I believe if we can do that, we could see the fruit of all of Alberta has heard the gospel. All of Canada has heard the gospel. Are you called to ministry? Yes. Here's our takeaway. Every member, this is the, every member a minister, every business a pulpit, every gathering a church. Every member a minister. I don't know what to say. That's my job to help you. Every member a minister, every business a pulpit, every gathering a church. And when the church becomes the ecclesia, everything changes. The group that comes to the building for weekly services is no longer just the sheep, but also the ministers. And the congregation no longer consists of only those who gather in the building, but also of the people in the city. That's our congregation. Come on. Man, when Paul got that, come on. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here confirming your word that what is... What I've spoken is just, what is just of me, I pray that would be forgotten. But what is of you, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd stir in each one of our hearts. Make a deposit there, I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, I pray that we would do it your way. Your timing. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here this morning, you don't yet have a relationship with Jesus. Probably, my guess is you resisted having relationship with God because you didn't like the institution. Guess what? <laughs> we don't either. Jesus didn't, and he never instructed to build institution. Jesus wanted a relationship with you. And becoming a follower of him doesn't mean that you have to be part of a church or part of religion it means you begin to have a relationship with him and that you get to be a minister too how cool is that Paul said this in Romans he said all you need to do to begin a relationship with Jesus is confess with your mouth that Jesus is God and believe in your heart that he rose again from the dead and you will be saved so we're going to do that right now I'm going to lead you in a prayer that confesses with your mouth that Jesus is God. And if you believe what you're praying right here, right now is true, then right in this moment, you can begin relationship with him. Let's pray this together. Everyone that's watching online, pray with me wherever you're watching from. Let's pray this together. Dear Jesus, I confess that you are God. And I believe you rose again from the dead. And I ask you right now to become my God, my Lord and Savior, and my friend, thank you for forgiving me of all my wrongs, for accepting me just as I am. I give my heart to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I'm going to ask everyone in the room to close their eyes, bow your heads out of respect to the people around you. If you prayed this for the first time, everyone else's eyes are closed, heads are bowed. If you prayed this for the first time, just boldly raise up your hand and give me a wave and say, yeah, Pastor, I prayed this prayer for the first time at the end of the service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At the end of the service, we'd love to give you a Bible. It's our free gift to you. Church, do you know why I use ver- almost verbatim the exact prayer at the end of every service? I do that very much on purpose. You know why I do that? I do that so that it gets so ingrained in you that when you go to pray for somebody else, because you're the pulpit, you meet somebody at work, you know exactly, hey, this is what we pray. Isn't God good? Come on. Let's stand and worship one more time. Clapping. Let's be the church. Such a cool reminder. Crazy. All right, if you can be seated for a moment. Any parents of small small kids in the house? Raise your hand. Okay. I get the very amazing privilege of being the father to my son. My son says some pretty incredible things sometimes. Uh, it was one morning. I woke up. I was just in the kitchen. He comes downstairs. He's like. 
I had a dream so good, it gave birth to another dream. <laughs> no word of a lie. Um, and then we were driving the other day. And don't please don't judge me for this. We were driving the other day. And it's just quiet. And all of a sudden he's like, Dad, those people are watching hockey in their living room. I love looking through windows. And I'm like, nope, we're going to work on that, buddy. Not going to go down that road. Um, <laughs> and when I, I just, oh my goodness. When I heard that, I'm just like, oh my gosh. I wonder what people, I wonder if people, it made me think of like an aquarium. You know, where you get to stand on the outside, but there's a whole world of stuff going on on the inside. And I, I wonder if that's what people think when they drive by our building. Where it's something they see the parking lot full. There's life happening in here, but they drive by and, and they're not a part of it. And they just drive by and it's like, wow, there's stuff happening in there. And I touched on this because I want to talk about generosity for a second. And if I were to be completely vulnerable and honest with you, like my wife and I would not be here without generosity. It is the only reason we are standing here today. And then it makes me think looking around this room at the empty chairs and I'm wondering like, man, if, like what lives are we not touching yet? Because we haven't tapped into just living a life of generosity. Who would be sitting in this auditorium right now? If we could just get past that barrier of understanding that what we have isn't ours. Like remember that verse I read you earlier about how God gives breath and life and everything else, which means that your job and my job, like we're gonna come upon that on our own strength, that that's a God-given thing. And then the blessing that comes from that and the income that comes from that isn't ours to hold on to and hoard, that it's actually his and it's meant to be recirculated throughout his kingdom from person to person to person through generosity. Man, I get excited hearing talking about overturning the soil of, of Alberta and Canada and the gospel being spread. And we can reach all the people, but if we can't help those people we reach, my gosh, church, generosity. When we talk about thanks being the key to worship and feeling that presence of God, generosity is the key to unlocking lives and helping people and meeting them exactly where they're at. And every Sunday we get to do this. And for us, it just became a natural behavior. It's like, you know what? We, we are just generous people. That's, that's such a more fulfilling way to live. And I don't want to be in an aquarium where people drive by and say, I wonder what's happening in there. Do you, raise your hand if you know what an aqueduct is. Okay. So an aqueduct used in Roman culture, but it used to be basically a channel of water flowing over bridges or over gaps to make sure water got from one place to another. And we can talk about like... Weird things, I'm going a little long, but I want you to get this. In Ezekiel 47, he says, the man brought me to the back entrance to the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east. And then the water was trickling from the south side. But then I want you to see this. Every month, because of the water going out, it would hit the lands. And it says every month, the trees bore fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. What I'm talking about here is that our generosity that flows out here is not meant to be an aquarium where people drive by and it's like, oh, they've got life so good in there. I wish, I, I just, I just, I'm just not a part of it. But when people drive by, they would actually see water flowing out of this place. And when you go to your workplace and you're actually acting and behaving like a minister, that then that aqueduct of your life flows into other people and your generosity becomes a stream of overflow for other people because we only need so much. The rest of it is overflow and belongs in the kingdom because we want to overturn Alberta, because we want to reach Canada. Amen? This is what we get to do. And if you look at giving as an obligation, you'll never give it to your fullest potential. But if you look at it as an opportunity, you'll realize God's in control. God's got my life. And what did I hand this out? When I hand this out, God's able to distribute far further than I ever strength. So church, this is the time to be generous. This is where we give. I'm gonna ask the ushers to come forward. You can give by cash with these buckets or you can go out in the lobby 
and meet one of our host teams out there to give, or you can use the Church Center app. I think we have a slide for it up there. Church Center app, you can give through online securely. Just don't, I want to encourage you, don't put a block where it doesn't need to be in, your, in regards to your generosity and your living. God wants to use your life in an extreme, extravagant way. Amen? Okay. God, we just thank you for your doing here today. Father, we thank you that you've blessed us to be a blessing to others. I thank you, God, that what comes in today is an aqueduct and flows into our community. It flows to the people that need it. It flows to God and it preaches the gospel in a way that words can't match. I thank you, God, that the generosity from this house changes lives today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Awesome. While that's going around, maybe you're here for the first time today and you're like, cool, I get it. What do I do next? Well, we have five steps. I'm going to try to make them as succinct as possible. Step number one is exactly what Pastor Kelly was just talking about. As you go out through this week into your workplace and into the marketplace, just love all. That's one of our core values. doesn't matter who it is. Love them. Go outside of yourself. Be generous towards them. Step number two, attend weekly. Why? Because when you get in the behavior of attending, it's just, it's a no-brainer. And not only that, you have community here. And life is really hard to do on your own which leads us to step three, which is connect. We don't do life in rows, we do it in circles. Maybe you're part of a connect group right now and maybe you're not and you need like a sphere of influence to speak, of people to speak into your life and encourage you. That's what our house parties and connect groups are all about. And if you're not a part of one, I highly encourage you to get in a group of people that meet weekly, that pray for each other, love on one another, show up at the hospital for each other. That's ministry outside of church. If you're not serving already and you know that you've got a gifting inside of you that can be used in a far greater way, there are so many ways that you can put your thumb into the kingdom and be like, I want to be a part of this. Your thumb, your hat, whatever it is. Put your hat in. Throw your hat in. I guarantee you, you are sitting in these seats with a gifting right now that could be used to a greater capacity. All it takes is you getting the courage to be like, I want to be a part of that. And then stepping into it. And if you want to do that, we have amazing people out in the lobby that'd be like, where would you like to serve? How would you like to help? And it's not just in this room on Sundays. Throughout the entire week, there's ways to be the church. And then finally, invite. Bring somebody with you next week. Fill that seat next to you with somebody that, you know what? I know a person that has a little bit of a skewed vert, like view on Christianity and church, and they're not all there. Next week is a time to bring them because, heck, I want to learn how to not be weird in the marketplace. Anybody else? If that's what we're taking, yeah, that's what's going on next week. So invite somebody, sit them down next to you and make sure that they get loved on while they're here, get a new here gift bag and everything else. Is that okay? Five easy steps. Cool? All right. Why don't you guys stand to your feet? There's an amazing after party happening after this on the patio as well. It's not carrots and vegetables. Don't leave. Some amazing people have spent dedicated time in preparing this meal for you and you're not going to want to miss it. God, we thank you so much for what you've done in this house today. Father, we thank you for the perspective you've given us of what you have for our lives. Not only that, but what we can do, God, in all these places that we go throughout the week. Help us to be effective in coming alongside others. God, let us minister wherever we're at. We thank you for what you've done in this place. Let it go out beyond these walls today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday for part three.